Hello, LOL. Um, listeners of LOL, uh, aspiring authors out there. Today we have uh, we have uh, Shivaji Das from Singapore. Uh, he's a travel log writer or travel memoir writer, a quite uh, you know uh, established, well known in the region. Um, so uh, let's welcome Shivaji and over to Danya to introduce Shivaji. Yes. Uh, Shivaji Das is the author of Amazon bestseller, The Other Chandelier, Journeys Through the Sino-Tibetan Frontier in Sichuan, Konat Books, and uh, Angels by the Murky River, Travels Off Beats and Roads uh, by Yoda Press, Journeys with the Caterpillar, Traveling Through the Islands of Flores and Sumba, Indonesia, and the Sacred Love, Erotic Art in the Temples of Nepal by Mandala Publications and Adarsh Books. He was the first prize winner of the Time Magazine Subcontinental Drift Essay Contest and shortlisted for Fair Australia Prize for short stories. Shivaji has been actively involved in the migrant issues and is uh, a com conceptualizer and organizer for the acclaimed migrant worker and refugee poetry contests in Singapore, Malaysia and Kenya, and is a founder and director of the Global Migrant. Shivaji's works and interests Reviews have been published uh, in magazines such as Time, South China Morning Post, Think China, Asian Geographic, Jakarta Post, Conscious Magazine, and so on. Uh, and I would also like to remind our audience that she was also is also an alumni of IIT Delhi and and IIM Calcutta. So yeah, this this is this is an intro, and I fantastic, think this is the longest fantastic. intro I've ever read. On <laughs> it's the a, LOL. LOL is honored uh, by your um, presence. Uh, so so very thankful, Shivaji, you could come on board. And um, we we have heard Jumpala Hiri, and many people say about something like mm. uh, you know books um, um, make us travel uh, far and wide without even lifting our feet. So for you. Uh, travel is one and books are uh, a part of your travel or the travel becomes part of your books. So during this pandemic times, uh, in your opinion, what is the future of publication of travelogue books? And uh, you can also share with, uh, uh, with us about uh, what you have been through in your publication journey, uh, please. Thank, thank Jayanti and thanks Danya for having me on this show and it's my great pleasure to be here as well. So it's a very interesting question and something that I get asked often like how will travel writing uh, evolve or does it even have a future given what we have faced in pandemic. And uh, when my previous book, The Other Shangri-La was released, that was at the peak of the pandemic yeah? and uh, our publisher was thinking that, okay, maybe let's wait for one more month when things will be better. And that one more month never came. So <laughs> eventually the publisher decided to just bite the bullet and uh, just launch it. And surprisingly, it received quite uh, good feedback, both in terms of, uh, from what I understand, the commercial numbers, as well as the audience uh, reviews and feedback. And uh, I believe that uh, much of that had to do with the fact that there was so much of pent up demand because things like uh, traveling uh, just outside our home, uh, we take it for granted. And there could be travel writing and travel experiences just when you step out of your home, even into your neighborhood. Yeah. And that was happening. So there was this uh, huge pent up demand, which I believe led to this interest in not just my book, but also other travel books which were there. Yeah? So uh, quite a few travel books were also launched, uh, at least in India from what I know. And uh, they did reasonably well during that period. And also the, in Singapore, I have been doing a few travel writing workshops in yeah. uh, Singapore courtesy of the National Library or- yeah, I'm uh, aware of it, yeah. Council. And uh, at that time, it was still possible to meet in person with certain restrictions. And uh, many of these were uh, very popular. There were 20, 30 people who signed up for these travel workshops and asked them the same question, like, uh, you know, why are you, uh, why are you here? Do you think that we could travel anytime soon? And they were saying like, yeah, and uh, as and when it happens, I want to be prepared to be able to capture my experiences. So I believe there is this pent up demand. And in a way, in other parts of the world, like US, uh, Europe, travel or China even, 
Uh, travel has become possible to a big extent, mostly as domestic, but uh, with the opening up uh, due to faster vaccination in many of these markets, uh, much of that travel will resume soon. And we already think that the way cruise bookings are getting filled up, the way China's domestic tourism has really bounced. So there is this strong pent of demand. And uh, when you love traveling, there will always be demand for travel writing. And uh, that's what will keep the genre going. And maybe there'll be a short boost even mm -hmm. uh, in the season when we are all able to go out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, nice. So uh, what do you believe in? Travel for books or travel for travel pleasure? For me, it's always travel for travel. So I consider myself first and foremost a traveler. And uh, then much way down the line, the writing comes, comes in. Uh, and also for travel writing, a lot depends on how you travel and uh, the, the kind of preparation as well as your uh, whole mental attitude or outlook towards traveling. So traveling is a very important part of travel writing itself and how you do it. And you need to love that. Uh, but if the book comes first, then there are many things which might happen, which might take away the fun and joy from traveling. You may be too obsessed with finding that story, finding that photograph, or uh, finding that person who can give you that sharp insight into the lives of people, which will take away a lot of the joy from traveling. So for me, uh, you know, I travel quite extensively, both for leisure as well as for my work and uh, I enjoy every moment of it. And uh, that comes uh, most important to me other than the writing part. Now, if I see a sizable amount of material that I may have collected, just because the travel was very enriching for me, then I decide that, okay, maybe I should uh, put this into paper and there is reasonably enough material and enough uh, highs and lows which can make a decent or interesting uh, reading for another person, uh, not for me, because for me, traveling was always very interesting. That travel was always very interesting, but there is enough material which might make it interesting for another third person. Who, and that's what leads to the book in some cases, very small percentage of cases okay. of total travel that I do in any year. Okay. Uh, uh, so my question is, uh, we all have travel essentials, right? We all have to take our phones and we have to take our passport and all that wherever we travel. But do, is there like a list of essentials for a travelogue? While you're traveling to write a book, do you have a list of essentials that you will have to have around you? Yeah. So uh, what I do is for some of the longer journeys that I undertake, uh, which could be three weeks or longer, I like to do some level of advanced preparation. So it's less of things I carry along, but uh, things I prepare myself with. So any long enough journey, which I, as I said, is three weeks or longer for me, given that I have a day job. Um, I always try to pick up a little bit of the language to the place I'm visiting mm. and it, it's mostly people who don't speak English as their first language. Uh, that's where I often go traveling. And uh, I will spend a good amount of time, at least six months, just trying to uh, pick up the basics of the language so I can converse at least day-to-day -day stuff, finding directions and all that. Uh, that initiative I do take. I do uh, a bit of research as well on the essentials, which is the history, the geography, the politics, the culture, the myths, legends, songs. These are some things which I find quite interesting. And I do a little bit of reading about them. I don't like to read too much before I travel because in that case, I tend to form my own biases and mm. I will probably think for confirming those biases uh, yeah. when I'm traveling. So I want to have a bit of that surprise element when I go traveling. And that's why I like to read a little bit uh, so that I have a broader context, but not too much uh, when, I, when I go traveling. Um, other than that is just uh, some sleeping pills to make sure that I get over the jet lag as fast as I can. Uh, and I carry along one or two books with me as well. And uh, then a list of people who, if I'm able to uh, get in touch with and talk to, when I'm traveling and uh, that's something I carry along as well. Now, uh, these may not be the most high profile celebrities in the place that I'm going to, but simple people, day-to-day uh, -day people, uh, could be an artist, could be a 
musician, could be a blogger, uh, could be another travel writer himself or herself, uh, social worker. So I, I like to build a list of such people, try to establish some contact with them before I go mm, and nice. meet them up uh, mm. during the course of my journey. I'm reminded of, uh, uh, we had some conversation uh, during one of our breakfasts in Gold Coast. You mentioned something about your wife and yourself uh, getting into the ship uh, and uh, traveling for the... Uh, to, to, ah, yeah. I mean, uh, such things are very interesting for a writer traveler, uh, traveler right? Mm, could you share with us uh, that kind of uh, an adventure travel? Uh, <laughs> have you written about that? Yes. So yeah, this was a trip where a bit of planning and organizing went beforehand uh, because it's not just possible to board a container ship. So I had to do some planning and some coordination with the shipping company before I could get on. Uh, and yeah, it was one of the most fascinating journeys and I would do that again anytime. <laughs> yeah. and it's, it's not so much about the journey uh, which is like in being in a, in a cruise maybe is similar in that sense. You have a lot more facilities and entertainment things uh, going around. But it's the whole possibility of interaction with the crew. And, uh, the crew who are used to living six months, eight months on the ship and their life, their stories, what they do when they're not on the ship. And also the workers, the contract workers who are becoming more and more common in the, the shipping industry the cook, the helmsman, the person who does the maintenance and repair. It's very hard, tough work for them with that added insecurity of losing the job at any point of time. And uh, in, the, in ships, usually there's a very uh, strong hierarchy, a kind of a feudal hierarchy that the officers live in certain kind of rooms and the others, they live in certain kind of rooms. They are served dinner, different dinner menus in different uh, dining tables. So there's all these social... Uh, characteristics in a in a ship in this small society of 30 odd people that goes from uh, one city to another over a course of few months. And also there are uh, issues related to say the mental conditions. I mean, captains of ships, they have a very stressful job and some are known to have committed suicide. There was a recent one as well. So there are these mental issues as well. There's the uh, thing about piracy, which happens on certain stretches. And uh, of course, uh, the rare occasions of storm, and then the whole history of how shipping has evolved from a very military uh, kind of uh, industry to uh, becoming a more of a commercial business oriented thing. So all these are quite fascinating when I spoke with all the, uh, all the crew, and that is possible uh, only in a container ship. It's not possible in a cruise ship. It's very difficult because uh, even they have second So you've written about it. Uh, Shivaji, yes, so I have written about this. It came as the first story in the, okay. my uh, second book, The Angels by the Mulky River. Oh. Uh, so that is also available, I think, online on Outlook magazine. Okay, okay, that's interesting. And uh, though, like, we can call a traveler as a non fiction, although we can categorize it as non fiction, there will be parts where we'll, you will be using fiction to amp it up, right? To make it to, to, you know, a uh, little twists and a little exaggeration to make the story more relatable or more uh, connectable for the audience. Where, mm -hmm. what, what part of your your tra travel logs do you think? Like, what is the ratio of the fiction to nonfiction when you write? Yes. So the purists in the industry, including uh, myself, I believe that you know while it may be debatable whether travel writing is fiction or nonfiction. Why I say it's debatable is because it's uh, it's unlike other kinds of nonfiction. Here you do make judgments about what to omit. You don't necessarily follow the sequence of events. So in a way, it's not pure nonfiction as such. So uh, I wouldn't call it fiction either. But where that element of fiction becomes uh, a bit dubious in some cases is that many travel writers are known to be liars and eventually they were caught to be lying or exaggerating <laughs> about things uh, that may have or may not have happened, including very famous ones like the Taiwanese writer Sun Mao or uh, Bruce Chatwin even. Uh, they have been later found to have exaggerated many parts of that. And that takes away a lot the credibility because uh, one, you are, uh, essential thing about travel writing is 
capturing the traits, capturing the character of the people that you have met. And if you are exaggerating or making up think about that, uh, that doesn't do justice uh, to both the reader as well as the people who you may have met or the culture that you, know, you may have encountered. So that's something I purposely try to avoid. Uh, where I make judgments is more about sequence of things, how they happened, uh, what to omit, uh, what to keep. Uh, and then also maybe I exaggerate sometimes or underplay sometimes my own emotions and my own uh, reaction to things which happened to me during the travel. So that's where I take the liberty. But in terms of what I heard, what I saw, I tried to keep to the facts as much as possible. So um, uh, what can the creativity or publishing, getting their poems published online, um, e-signs and all, what, what can that do to a migrant worker? Uh, what have you seen um, that, that making an impact on them or uh, on the community by itself or individuals? So uh, this is on a different topic, which is about the work that I do with uh, migrant workers, as well as refugees. Uh, and our uh, the whole platform is about giving a voice to people who are underrepresented in our media or in our general consciousness. Even though they are highly visible, they are not audible. So you can easily see a migrant worker refugee by the way they look, uh, by the way they dress, their color of skin, and the way they speak and all that. But uh, even though they are so highly visible, they are not audible. And uh, that takes away a lot of their agency. And that's what the whole uh, purpose of organizing these uh, events are. And uh, what uh, we, hope to, uh, we hope to do is that instead of NGOs talking about the issues, uh, instead of government organizations or researchers talking about their issues, there's a certain power in having a direct voice uh, and giving that to them and it's up to them how they want to utilize it and what they want to convey. So that's the whole point of organizing uh, these events. Uh, on the audience side, uh, when we first started this event in Singapore to begin with or in Malaysia, we were actually very surprised to hear comments like, oh, we didn't know that migrant workers can be so talented or they can be so articulate, which was a surprise reaction to me because uh, mm -hmm. you know I would have rather uh, been happier if the audience took a feedback like, oh, these are the issues which migrants face, or these are the kind of complexities they have to live through. Rather, the initial reactions for the first time uh, audience is always like, oh, they can also, <laughs> you know, they can also speak in a proper way, which is, which is a bit unfortunate. But uh, in a way, it has led to a bit of awareness and assimilation uh, partially. I wouldn't say it goes the whole way, uh, but it has led to that. And like any any other uh, social movement where culture has an important role to play, but a small role, I would still say, yeah. And that's what we are trying to do through these uh, migrant and refugee cultural events as well, because you know, culture works at a more subconscious, uh, subtle level, uh, which direct activism uh, may sometimes turn off people and may have a more short-term uh, impact rather than the way culture can. So culture has always played an important role in any social movement and this is what we are trying to do as well through this contest and through these events. Got it. Uh, coming back to your books again, uh, how, how how has the editing process been through your uh, through travelogues? Because for fiction or non-fiction, we know there are editors. We, we can check facts if we want to, but when it's a travelogue and when it's your own uh, your perceptions and your own experiences through the travel, how do you go about editing it? Are there specific uh, editors or proofreaders available for these? Did you use them or did you have yeah. to do any other uh, work beyond that? So a lot of the uh, first editing is done by myself and uh, I follow what Stephen King had uh, suggested as a recommendation towards all writers as that uh, after you finish a chapter or a manuscript, forget it for six weeks and then come back to it. And my editing is more in terms of uh, what to uh, omit, uh, which parts are not adding to the story, which parts are not keeping the reader uh, interested. Uh, I, I try to shorten as much as possible my, my initial draft. Yeah, one guideline I follow is to reduce my initial draft by almost 40%. Yeah. My initial draft is more whatever comes to my mind. 
uh, and then I tried to cut it down uh, to 60% of what it used to be. And then, uh, uh, fortunately, so far I have been uh, I've been blessed with a few gifted editors from my publishers who have uh, who have taken a very sharp uh, razor to the grammatical mistakes. You know, uh, having a having a business job, uh, it's it's uh, we tend to lose a lot of the grammatical nuances of the English language, and uh, a lot of the corrections happen at that point uh, from that perspective. But also, the editor does. A bit, of, a bit of fact check. Uh, uh, my focus on uh, doing uh, travel, uh, on writing about travel is less to focus on my club, but more on the people that I meet and some of the sites and uh, history and culture of the place as well. And I would say almost uh, 50 to 60 percent of my writing in travel genre has to deal with dialogues, has to deal with conversations which I've had with people. And that's where I, I do have to be a bit sensitive because I've traveled to a few areas where there were political uh, clashes happening or there were disputed status about their independence and all that. And I had to be sensitive about uh, disclosing the previous, uh, disclosing the identity of the people I met in certain sensitive cases. And I had to take some judgment, make some judgments to make sure that it's not easily, the person is not easily identifiable or traceable. Uh, those are some of the things that I try to do on my behalf when I do editing, but uh, much of the heavy lifting in terms of uh, grammar, in terms of uh, fact checks are done usually by my publishers. Editing. Tell us about your With first the book. Uh, first book, uh, how could you get the publisher for your first book? Did you know the publisher personally or did you knock the doors of many publishers? Uh, uh, sending proposals. How was that beginning? Can you share yeah. that? So the story of the first book is very similar to the story of the last book as well and every book that I've written. Uh, I've, I've been knocking doors of uh, maybe 100, 200 publishers around the world and uh, receiving 99 failures out of 100, 99 rejections, uh, including no responses. And then uh, it just took one a publisher to find it interesting enough and agree. And that's how all my books have so far, uh, so far had their journeys. Uh, I'm, I'm going to be uh, writing another business book for a change. Uh, this will be the first time I'm writing a business book, which is different from the other ones in that sense that I didn't have the manuscript as yet ready. Uh, and I just sent a proposal and it got accepted. And after that, I began writing and it should be out in October. Oh, that's but interesting. Even have the manuscript mm -hmm. ready, and I will send a proposal out of 100. Maybe one or two will ask for the full manuscript, then I'll send that there's a long wait. And then uh, <coughs> finally, one there is a contract which comes in. I do. Mm. Okay. Uh, but uh, uh, sorry, I'm butting in. You said without the manuscript ready, you just sent a proposal. Uh, what if they're asking you sample chapters? Are you ready with the sample chapters? Okay, so uh, for my other travel and art books, uh, I had the full manuscript already ready. So I could, when no, I said this, this particular book, I was interested in yeah. knowing. Uh, no, this was no, uh, I, I didn't have the sample chapters ready, but it was a business book and uh, the publisher was very keen on the overall concept and the approach that uh, me and my two other co-writers were taking. Uh, so it didn't require, it, they didn't ask for a sample chapter in that case. Uh, so mm -hmm. It kind of went through. Just this is, this is something new that we are hearing for the first time. I, <laughs> I and, know. That's because why that's why usually was... the procedure, right? People usually ask for sample <laughs> chapters. Right? I know. That's so, why uh, I was <laughs> interested in asking more so of It that. shows how much the publisher trusts uh, you as authors must be that that, that, yeah, that I think that, that could be only, one reason uh, yes. take away from depends this. on that mm. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and uh, see with the with the advent of social media and this uh, trend of tra vlogging travels right there have been so many people who vlog their travels and because it's an av you the experience is going to be more wholesome than a travelogue as a mm. book Right. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you find do you find that uh, th the audience of yours are being taken up by that? Like, uh, do you think that that is a competition to travelogue writers 
or do you think it's it's just a compliment to the travelogs that you're doing so i mean there is a bit of competition for sure and for better or for worse there has been an explosion in travel genre whether it's uh, instagram whether it's uh, tip advisor reviews that could be considered travel literature as well whether it's just tweets about travel youtube videos or uh, even nowadays you have three dimensional uh, 3d content which is coming up which can give you the experience of being in a certain venue right away but there are different uh, uh, things which are popular in the different genre yeah so uh, uh, blogs or uh, online journals they are very good for listicles like top 10 to visit in singapore or top 10 beaches to visit in indonesia so these kind of listicles do very well on uh, blogs and journals and then on videos things which work well are things like festivals uh, you just want to have a 3 minute uh, snippet of the festival or nature you show the kind of nature there is in a certain place or you can show interviews with interesting people you have met along with uh, during that similarly photographs or instagram they work well with festivals or nature or portraits that you have met uh, during your travel what i focus in which is and and then of course there are the travel guides which talk about the list of accommodations and restaurants to go to hotels to go to what i focus on are more the personal stories of people who i have met uh, during my journeys and that's where uh, i believe uh, the form that i practice which is more of the written word supplemented by some pictures and occasionally some videos of course but uh, they take a second uh, stand uh, when it comes to uh, my output uh, so i tend to focus on individuals their stories their history the culture of the place and that's where the written form on the printed book or on a kindle uh, serves a lot more handy and maybe there is a different audience or readership for that as well you know uh, i i myself look at a lot of listicles especially during the lockdown what to do in singapore i have been looking at a lot of listicles uh, so there is a different need and a different segment for for all these forms so you have conducted many workshops for travelog writing have you come across any uh, remarkable potential that uh, you could uh, nurture to you know uh, bring out the author in that person have you come across any such potential authors uh, I, I, have you uh, you know um, seen them grow as a rock author have you seen any yeah. so uh, i have been fortunate enough to uh, have given workshops to both uh people who have some experience of writing or some experience of being a, a travel writer as well as to beginners and intermediates yeah? uh as well as to beginners i mean uh with beginners as with uh, any other literary genre the the tendency to not follow through or not uh pursue this is very common i would say 99 out of 100 will <laughs> probably not not end up writing anything but uh, yeah i mean uh, there was a doctor in singapore uh, she had attended my workshop a couple of years back and we have been in contact uh, on and off uh, she has been asking me about suggestions where to go what kind of things to cover what kind of uh, literature to follow and all that after that and uh, after three years she uh, had actually published a book oh and, fantastic uh, well in singapore so i was really satisfied with that mm-hmm. um and also been these uh, existing travel writers or intermediate travel writers who have uh, taken my workshop they have published uh, very significant works as well in australia oh, and, oh that's uh, good yeah, i think they are maybe better than me <laughs> in, in doing oh <laughs> you got to read I, those I books have you got yeah, have you got copies of the books to read uh no i think i have got one of them yes yes, yes. okay from one of them. so is that is that like the best uh, compliment that you can yeah yeah that's why i asked him you mean just and doing uh, something much better <laughs> yes yes in the way i mean like, uh, i think you know most of my workshops are short duration workshops so uh, and a maximum length i have given a workshop for is 7 uh, hours spread over two days so 14 hours uh, usually my workshops are 3 hours just giving a basic introduction and all so i wouldn't like to take a lot of credit for what these people have achieved 
I think it's a brand new well and right set significant work, but I don't think I can. But the inspiration <laughs> comes anyway, you know. <laughs> um, inspiration comes yeah. from the workshop, no? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, from your from your uh, bio that I read out, it's it's obvious that each of your book is published by different publications, <laughs> right? <laughs> but <laughs> usually, what happens when when your first book is picked up by a publisher and they like the sales or the promos pro promos that you have used or the way the book has sold they are going to uh, trust you to give you give them yeah. another book and it's it's very common for any author to stick to a particular publisher yes. did you do yes. this deliberately did you want to branch out to different publishers or did it, did it just happen on its own uh yes and no uh <laughs> for my business book which is going to be coming out with wiley uh all of them were with independent publishers yeah independent houses before that and uh, they were small small publishers i mean the first print will be like a uh, thousand copies and uh with my second one it was five thousand copies the first print yeah uh, and even though uh, they managed to sell out the first print of many of these, I, I was always looking for having a bigger outreach uh, in the next. So in a way, uh, sounding selfish to some extent, I was trying to aim slightly higher <laughs> at circulation, uh, <laughs> not necessarily in terms of quality or anything, but in terms of circulation, I was trying to aim for uh, publishers with better distribution. Or, mm. uh, with, uh, but having said that, my previous book, The Other uh, which came out with Konark. I was also very satisfied with the whole publishing process. You know, usually publishers tend to be a bit aloof and even though they are available, they tend to say that we are not available, we are busy. <laughs> but uh, my last publisher, Konark, has been very professional throughout their team and I really enjoyed uh, working with them. So we are in talks about my next uh, collection, travel collection as well. Uh, but the business book, as I said, it's a different genre and uh, that's where I'm looking at. Uh, we are working with Wiley for that we publish. Okay. And uh, because you are a travelog writer, you must have uh, used a lot of pictures in your books, right? Uh, there are going to be pictures, and there are going to be some form of illustration. How does that work? Do do usually publishers request for the author itself to uh, give all that material or? Uh, is it, can you find them uh, somewhere else or can you find photographers who are exclusively used for this? How does that process go? Yeah, I mean, nowadays, you know, because of Google image search or Bing image search, it's very easy to find images of almost all places in the world. Yeah. Uh, having photographs uh, do not add a lot to the written content, unless it captures some special occasions, you are able to capture some special people that are highlighted in the book or some moments which were uh, revealing in themselves. And that's where your own pictures uh, become relevant. Um, more and more, I've uh, been taking less and less photographs as I've been traveling. Yeah, I found that tracks me and I get more obsessed with capturing that perfect moment or that perfect smile or that perfect grimace and that distracts me from interacting uh, and responding to the environment uh, which is there. So I've been taking less and less photographs uh, but also uh, I think in publishing uh, industry it's it's more expensive to print photographs and uh, mm. all my publishers today will usually have a few photographs maybe about 10 to 20 in a few pages which are of different quality in the center as a center. Uh, and then I will provide an online link in my website, uh, which provides uh, videos and other photos in case the reader is uh, interested. Uh, having said that, the art on the art book that I've written, which is about the erotic art in the temples of Nepal, that's uh, largely a photography collection. There are more than 120 pictures, full page yeah. pictures, and then about a 30-page essay accompanying that. So I've dabbled in different genres which have had different requirements. But for travel, yeah, it's always been a few photographs which only add to the story uh, from my perspective, and then the rest are uploaded on my website. So are you maintaining a, a separate website for each of your book or all of the book one in one website? Are you? Uh, they're all in the same website, same. but they're different. Yeah. I see. Okay. All by different. 
Okay. Uh, I think Zoom might cut. Uh, yeah, I, I wanted to know how has social media played a part in promoting or uh, uh, selling your book? Yeah, that's a uh, question. And uh, for me, I haven't found it very useful. I think social media is useful for promoting books or any other material for people who already have a large and genuine fan following or genuine uh, uh, reach in that sense, because, uh, you know, for other writers who don't have it and who have to build it from scratch, A, the uh, output or the benefit that you get from uh, all this is uh, little. Uh, it will only be your friends and family members who will see the deal and they will get irritated within two days. <laughs> but uh, unless you have that reach, uh, one, it's very tiring and taxing. And two, it takes away a lot of mental space as well. You are constantly checking whether there was one more <laughs> like social media update. So I, I don't get much benefit from that. Um, I don't really focus on uh, social media as a promotion tool. I think uh, those who already have established reach and they could be either influencers or celebrities and all, uh, when they write a book subsequently, for them it's uh, handy in that sense. And I mean, some travel writers in India, they used to have uh, quite powerful uh, blogs or uh, social media profiles in traveling. And even in the US, they, they were there. They were YouTube stars with their travel videos and all that. And then they went on to write a book, which did reasonably well. So that that is another way of doing things. But for someone like me, who has only a limited number of close friends, it was not, uh, uh, not that uh, useful. And I decided not to focus on it. For me, book reviews, uh, whether in established media or uh, journals, blogs, uh, they were a lot more uh, impactful when it uh, came to driving sales. So uh, okay. when you say uh, social media didn't help you, I have uh, come across a few uh, publishers. When we send proposals, they are asking the first thing they are asking mm -hmm. is about your, um, you know, social media handles. How large is yeah. your circle and uh, so that's that's uh, that's one thing the second is yeah. uh, what do you think about the bestseller myth uh, 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 okay bestseller uh, what whatever they say in amazon bestseller this uh, bestseller uh, uh, do you think they are um, organic they are really natural or are they created uh, how much can we really uh, you know believe in that bestseller uh, thing mm -hmm. what's your opinion on that I think a publisher will be better equipped to talk about that because I'm not directly involved in the commercial or the sales of the book per se. And my understanding of that is largely based on uh, indirect analysis or interpretation. Uh, but I did notice that whenever the reviews of my books came out in large national newspapers in India or Singapore, uh, say like Straits Times or uh, in India, like the Hindu or uh, Business Standard and all that, uh, then the sales immediately went up and it became like a number one uh, on Amazon for a few okay. days. So, it's so it's uh, I, I found that correlation. So in a way, there is some genuine way in which okay. uh, it does. Okay. I, I don't know the nitty gritties of uh, how they work. But again, it you know, you can always, uh, some writers I know, especially self-published writers, they try to find genres where there are very little competition and it's easy to become a bestseller very easily. So they, uh, so they try to categorize their books in those very specific uh, categories where there is a high chance of becoming a bestseller. And then it stays there and it gets more visibility and so on. Uh, so yeah, those kind of things uh, do happen uh, in, the, in the publishing world as well. So um, um, uh, she had two... I think, yeah, I had one, I have one more question to ask you. Um, how, what parts have uh, reviews, reviews of your book? Because you have already said that uh, social media reviews were, I mean, social media wasn't of much help. So what part has uh, reviews through magazines and other books helped you in your promotion or in selling? Did you have to pay for reviews? Did you have to ask uh, uh, magazines and newspapers for reviews of your books? 
to promote them or uh, that process was, was not done. Yeah. So I, I think I will also add a little bit to my previous response on social media as well. And uh, while I have actually found social media useful is, uh, is in two areas. One is in the writing process itself. As I was mentioning before, I go somewhere, I try to connect with people who I may like to talk to. And that's where social media has been very useful. I will just search mm. for in Uzbekistan in uh, Facebook and I'll get a few names and then I'll connect with them. So on the research part, building these connections and then subsequently meeting them. That's very media. nice. <laughs> And also, uh, the other thing is to network with uh, publishers, editors, commissioning editors, book reviewers, uh, that as well, I have found uh, this quite useful. As I was saying, uh, may, most of my books so far have been published by independent publishers uh, who have few contacts in the uh, newspaper industry but, uh, or the magazines industry. But uh, I've also relied on my own efforts to reach out to some of the uh, newspapers, uh, their book editors and others to explore whether they would consider my book for the review. And uh, in many cases, they have obliged and uh, they have put me on a long uh, queue at the, at, you know, uh, it may take sometimes six months, eight months to get the review out in a, in a newspaper. But at least I know that it's happening. And once it happens, it's a big impact, as I was telling you. Uh, it immediately goes into... Have you, have you had anyone... Uh... Uh, write to you like people you met or people who have read your book write to you that uh, uh, this part of your book uh, was uh, has influenced them or this part of the book was very real for them also and all that because in travelogue i just want to know how this uh, you know how people relate to travelogues different from fiction <clears throat> yeah yes uh, they have not written to me but uh, in uh, in uh, in the old days, good old days, before the pandemic, I used to travel around quite a bit, uh, talking about my book and giving uh, or reading small excerpts of it in cafes, in bookshops, in libraries, universities, and so on. Uh, there, uh, when I do the readings, when I talk about the place, the culture, the people, and all, there will be some very strong feedback, and uh, uh, that, that would happen. And uh, it was actually more... Uh, interesting for me and more fulfilling for me to to be interacting with a world which was curious about others and uh, which was hearted and open-minded enough to have taken the effort to listen to uh, writing about some other people and most of the time it's about developing or less developed countries so these interactions are much cherished uh, by me of course it has become a bit more difficult because of the pandemic, uh, even though we have had quite a few webinars about the book and all that, uh, it's a different experience than having even a small gathering of six people discussing your book uh, face to face. So I really hope that we can go back to that as soon as possible, because that's one of the highlights and one of the reasons why I have kept on writing uh, these interactions with a younger group, an older group of people who are still so curious and want to know about uh, others other than them. Yes. Great, great. I think the entire world is waiting for that day. For, for when we yes. can all get back together as humans and interact with each other and be humans again. Have you ever uh, so thought yeah, this, of, I think now we, have you ever thought of uh, an audio book of your books? Audio versions? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, usually that decision is made by the publisher from what I know and uh, uh, I may be wrong in this, but audiobooks are a lot more popular in places like uh, US, where people drive long distances mm. and they put mm -hmm. uh, audiobooks. Uh, less so in the region where I have been most active in, whether it's Singapore or Southeast Asia or India. It may be changing. Uh, it's changing India. while walking and jogging and, you know, know, you know uh, Correct. exercising. Correct. We're all, Correct. Uh, we are listening to books. So, yeah, correct. So uh, it, it will probably be a decision of the publisher. Uh, the business book that I mentioned, which is coming out in the US, it will be primarily uh, targeted towards the US market. That will have an audio book. Uh, that will be great. Share. My mm -hmm. other travelogue, there are no plans currently on. on so uh, like, like Pico Air is doing, do you want to give your voice to the audio book? Pico Air is doing yeah. his own books. 
yeah. I, I, I actually one of the things I don't like about myself is my voice. <laughs> like <laughs> among I, the many things even I don't, I don't like, don't like, like <laughs> my <laughs> yeah. voice. Yes. Among the many things which I don't like about myself, uh, one. But it, it gives voice. a it's a, it gives a personal uh, touch to yeah. the your own yeah, words. Sure. Like gives a human picture. touch basically yes. yeah yeah yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i think now we can go go on to the next segment which is uh, wow uh, world of w's and which are uh, yeah uh, w questions yeah, like missed, what when where just, how just, and all that like and then yeah we missed the diversity okay. yeah, yeah yes that question we have missed uh, maybe we can go to yeah, yeah, please, uh, before that uh, shivaji Uh, we find uh, this travel or writing journal is uh, quite male dominated um, what's your uh, opinion on that and um, maybe you could share with us the reasons uh, possible reasons behind that yeah thanks thanks for that question and yeah it's very true that it used to be very um, white men centric yeah not just male centric, oh, but white oh. men centric oh. in that sense and that has to do a lot with the history and the security situation i mean uh, in many countries in the past women were not allowed on board uh, ships and boats because it was considered as bad omen to have a woman on board mm-hmm. uh, so men natural travelers in, uh, in in history and also uh, much of the exploration after the industrial revolution was happening from europe uh, in that sense it became more white men centric uh and then they had the economic power and the time and a demand and a market which could sustain them but it's changing i must say it was started uh, changing in the west with more women lgbtqs uh, taking up this travel writing genre transgenders like yan morris and all who are quite well known uh then you have uh, also in this part of the world it's also changing so in india for instance shivya nath has become quite a successful a uh, travel writer herself in uh, indonesia uh, trinity is a very well known uh, female travel writer and uh, th- it's changing over time you have a lot of gay writers lesbian travel writers who are telling their own stories uh, when it comes to travel and especially on the online media yeah on the online uh, world of blogs and uh, podcasts travel podcasts travel youtube women are much better represented and lgbtqs uh, non white uh, genres are getting better and better represented over time so it's changing but it's uh, still a long way to go uh, some of the interesting things that are happening are to have uh, women travel writers who are very few at this point also because of the biases they face you know uh, first of all being a woman and traveling is not always very safe and uh, secondly uh being a black travel writer uh, they also felt uh, also often feel a lot of prejudice and biases against them so that's another genre which is changing uh maybe we also need to have more working class travel writers because you have mm. a lot of these <laughs> travel writers <laughs> who have certain perspective and they interact with a certain kind of people uh, but maybe there is a case for working class travel writers homeless travel writers because they are great travelers you know homeless people uh, they are one of the greatest travelers we have today so there is a uh, untapped uh, market or genre mm. of these mm. people so me interesting that's that's very interesting thank you shivaji <laughs> uh, yeah now i think i think it's time to pass yes. over to world of w's yes yeah. uh, we have already uh, like gone through what i mean world of w is a, is a set of w questions like what when where how and all that and it is like you don't have to elaborate on each question it just can be discrete and little small answers are enough because uh, if a listener is not able to listen to the entire session they can just scroll down and come here to just get a gist of the session of uh, into who you are and as an author and what your books are about Yeah, I think uh, Miss Jayanti can ask the first question. You, you go ahead. I will. Hmm. Okay. Uh, who are your target audience, uh, Mr. Shivaji? I'm looking at anyone who is curious towards the world, and uh, of course, so far my publishers have heavy presence in India and Southeast Asia, so that's where most of the readers have come from. But also in the United States and UK. 
but it's all uh, people who love traveling and who are curious about other cultures and uh, other other worlds. Any possibilities of uh, other genres from you, like uh, fiction or? Uh, yes, uh, because of the lockdown and uh, you know we uh, were not able to travel, and I had a very dry funnel in that sense of the last mm. week. It comes oh. to travel writing. So I've been dabbling a little bit with uh, short stories. Oh, and uh, that's hopefully fantastic. Some public pick up once the, uh, once the whole collection is complete. Somewhere. That's lovely. <laughs> why, why are most of your books, I mean, almost all of your books are centered around South Asian uh, travels? Do you uh, no, plan on branching out South to... Yeah, my publishers are South Asian travelers, but my books have been about China, have been about uh, Indonesia, Brazil, uh, anywhere in the world. Yeah. So when is your next book due? Your travel, uh, when is it due? And when is this short story coming out? This must be uh, the story collection is yet to be complete. So I'll be looking for a publisher for that. Uh, my next travelogue, as I was mentioning, I'm still having different discussions with my current publisher but the next book which will be coming up is a business book business. about pandemic and its impact and how company dealt with it it is uh, on behalf of Wiley which will be coming up in October uh, this year you said it's a co-author uh, that book, can have right? audience uh, that one yes, is so, so how many of you how many of you are going uh, together writing it uh, three of us three of you all of them are from Singapore no, uh, two of us are from Singapore and one is from the US. Okay. Where can our audience find your work? Like, do you have a particular website or uh, how, where all your they can books go are available? Wiley.com, which has all the pictures, social media, uh, reviews, and event details. And so, uh, where can uh, we find your books? Are they available on Amazon? Or yes, they are all on Amazon, uh, both as ebooks as well as uh, paper books, and uh, in many good bookstores all around India, Southeast Asia, most of the books are available as well. What is the future of travel and travelogue books post COVID? Yeah. Yeah. From uh, what you see, yes. <laughs> <laughs> there will, of course, be a short books as soon as uh, the whole pandemic is over, and there'll be a big spike. Uh, on that, although it may take a few years to happen yet, uh, depends on the vaccination rates and all that. So I don't foresee travel returning to normal uh, or the 2019 kind of numbers anywhere before 2024, 2025. Yeah, uh, but once that happens, I think it will follow its steady path. Uh, there are some numbers by World Tourism Organization that there will be 1.8. Uh, billion travel by 2030 and so on. Uh, and it's very bright given that only 3% of Chinese um, have passports which they have used for international travel and maybe only 1% of Indians have, uh, have a passport. So there are these huge untapped markets who will, uh, who will spur this whole uh, travel industry. On the travel writing part, it's going to be very interesting, uh, in particular because of technologies that are coming up uh, in the digital world. And um, I believe that uh, some of the articles that we see today, like listicles or uh, top 10, you know, those kind of articles may actually be written by robots at uh, some point of time, and that could be very soon. And uh, travel writers will have to then work very hard. They will have to work to, to really capture them. Yeah. characters <laughs> and find niches within the genre which cannot be captured in the digital world automatically. Mm. Interesting, very interesting. So uh, is there uh, anything you would like to uh, tell our audience uh, about this podcast and uh, your experience with it and, and your parting words for, your, for our audience? So thanks, thanks for organizing this. It's a very useful podcast, I believe, because uh, while there are uh, many podcasts and forums which talk about uh, the books or the writers themselves. This focuses more on the publishing uh, aspect of a book. And there are so many aspirant writers among all of us. And it just takes a little spark and a little motivation to get started, perhaps. And towards that initiative, this is a very uh, useful uh, addition, I would say. 
And uh, I, one last uh, word that I would say is that, um, you know, keep traveling and start writing. I think these are the two things I would like to say. Uh, traveling is very important because it uh, opens your mind. It exposes you to a world which is not familiar to you, which is very necessary because today we are seeing so much of polarization among all of us. And, uh, you know, once you meet face to face, a uh, person and experience uh, his or her situation, uh, even your strongest enemy can become a uh, friend. And that is why traveling is friend. Friend. And <laughs> similarly, I think uh, just to start writing is important because yes. everyone has different ways of uh, experiencing things, different ways of telling things, and they all enrich the whole world that we live in. And instead of uh, thinking about that, I want to write a book someday, that will never happen. So the only way to get out of that is to start writing. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Shivaji, you. Thank for you so such much. a lovely session with us. Um, all the best for all your books uh, in future. All the best.